I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yes, Anuranjita, I think both of us are on presented access. Uh, we just need to see whether the attendees are able to hear us or not. Okay. 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 Thanks, Arika. So let's start okay. with the sure. webinar. Uh, wishing everyone on the call a great afternoon and a warm welcome to the BD Foundation Women of Influence webinar with Anuranjita Kumar, CHRO City, South Asia. My name is Rashmi and I lead the diversity and inclusion practice for BD Foundation in South Asia. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the third webinar for this year with our network of global thought leaders. We at BD Foundation believe in getting professionals together and getting them a platform where there is an exchange of ideas, which is educative and also provides an open space to learn. As part of a sustainable initiatives, which includes a corporate networking group, internal women leadership journeys and the LEAP program, which is a crossed industry mentoring platform for women leaders, we are very happy to curate the Women of Influence series of webinars for the year. This also gives an opportunity to our emerging women leaders and our clients to engage on diverse topics, which is beneficial not only to the individual, but also to the organization and the society that we live in. So I welcome everyone again on the call and a big thank you for joining in today afternoon. We have been fortunate enough to have thought leaders around the world believing in our cause and volunteering their time to speak. In the past, we've had uh, Rani Anderson, Dr. Helen Turnbull and Howard Ross, to name a few who spoke to us from the US. And lately, uh, Jane Horan and uh, the last webinar with Zarina Stanford, Chief Marketing Officer, SAP, uh, they spoke from Singapore. Today, we have Anuranjita, Chief Human Resource Officer, South Asia, speaking to us from uh, career in 1994 with PNG and after several exciting stints across the Middle East and Europe, returned, returned to India as the CHRO Citibank South Asia in 2012. Anuranjita is the first woman management committee member at City India. She is on the board of City Services India Limited, advisory board member of SHRM India, member of the South Asia Executive Council Conference Board, member of CII National Core Committee on Human Resources, member of the National Human Resources Forum India, and the board trustee for American India Foundation. She has also been recognized as amongst the most powerful HR professionals of India by the World HRD Congress, and amongst the most powerful women leaders in Fortune in 2013. Anuranjita works between Mumbai and Gurgaon, and her book, Can I Have It All? Return as a Memoir, talks about her evolving identity as a woman and at, 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 at the workplace. The book has been on the top of the charts and still one of the best sellers in the country. So welcome Anuranjita. Thank you very much. Thank and you very it's a pleasure much. to be interacting with all of you. So I am looking forward to the session today. Thank you. Thank you Anuranjita. So most of the women face dilemmas and challenges through various stages of our lives, such as education, marriage, maternity, and mobility. But only a few of us have a compelling vision to reach the top by challenging social norms, stereotypes, and willingness to go their extra mile. We would love to hear your thoughts and your story on the day. Uh, thanks, Trashmi. I think it's uh, playing that uh, one you've uh, chosen to call me on this seminar. Uh, you know, every time I have these interactions, uh, I just feel that I actually very selfishly walk away from more learnings uh, for myself. Um, and uh, so I'm quite looking forward uh, for this to be a very interactive and, uh, you know, a forum where we exchange thoughts and ideas with each other. <laughs> so starting off from, you know, um, the cue that Rashmi has given me in terms of uh, how do we propel ourselves forward. Um, you know, I, coming into this webinar, I recently had a situation where uh, I had a really high potential woman who used to work for me. And uh, she was a star performer and I yet believe she has a high potential to go places. Um, you know, married, had a kid, went off on mat leave, the usual, and uh, and I think there was an incident while she was away on mat leave where she lost her mother as well. Now, you know, it was one of those situations where you knew this girl was very, very driven and really wanted to make something out of her professional pursuits. 
but was completely caught up with dilemma of you know what happened at home uh, and also the fact that she was a new mother so the next call i got was you know i don't think i know i can continue and maybe i will take a break and i'll be at home because my dad needs me my sister needs me so forth so on and uh, all of that is right but you know my only advice to her was that for the fear of things going wrong you don't stop living or for the, for the fear of dying you don't stop living so yes today is a tough day uh, but you know life is cyclical and this shall pass but if you let go of what you have because you want to address what's the priority at hand um it would be a lost opportunity so we discussed and we kind of made it work for her by letting her be at home or structuring an assignment she can do at home but i often you know find these situations and the reason i share that incident is it's not a one off i have these conversations every day every week every month one crisis at home just kind of you know tears us apart and that probably tears women apart much more than it does with men now you can say you know you can blame it on the social factors that um, you know we all kind of grow up in or we live in but let's first focus upon ourselves so i will come back to this whole socialization bit but um, you know going back to myself um, i started uh, you know my life or rather i was born in a small place called rishikesh and then spent a large uh, uh, part of my childhood in dehradun and uh, as i grew up we were two sisters and um, you know and my mother who was a doctor uh, was constantly told you know do ladkiyan hain so you know you got to figure out then how you going to manage it and all of that stuff and i could never really make sense of those conversation in fact they used to be annoying to a point and my mother would always respond by saying uh, you know my daughters will be my son because i used to say look why do i have to you know why do i have to be a son uh, why can't i just be a daughter and do what i'm supposed to do type of thing um and so i kind of grew up in a very passive yes. environment but nevertheless you know a lot of dissonance used to creep in when these discussions would happen i went to boarding very early in my life so one thing which a boarding school teaches you is taking your decision fairly quickly uh and um, so i think that bit came to me quite easily uh, funnily enough you know i chose my profession i chose my husband i chose which city i wanted to live in and sometimes in my marriage it used to be a point where we used to go curtain shopping and my husband would say you will buy all the furniture curtain without even talking to me but i think that was decision making to an extreme but so i think i grew up in that environment and uh, you know i my mother always aspired that one of her daughters should go in the medical school right so i kind of uh, was the older one and somehow uh, a little more obligated to fulfill that expectation so i applied for medicine and i got to the exam and i started my medical um, yeah, uh, studies and then as i pursued it i realized that's not really what i wanted to do and this is where the dissonance comes in with taking decision versus fulfilling somebody else's expectation so i decided to get out of the medical school is a big decision and uh, something which my parents were very happy about um, but the first time where the the whole you know thing about taking a bet on yourself don't on me and i was all of 17 or 18 so a bit nervous because you know who leaves a medical seat and says okay i will go and do psychology uh, but i just knew what i did not want i didn't know what i wanted at that stage but i knew what i didn't want and there so there was a bit of you know you take a bet on yourself because if you don't who else will and that's how my you know uh, graduation in psychology started and on xlri and hr and then i started to work and uh, when i started working uh, i think my my parents didn't know the schools because they came from a very different profession so they pretty much left me on my own which i think was very sensible um and as i started to work i kind of joined procter and gamble from camp and at that point of time time you know i found my life partner and my husband uh, to be was working with unilever and as most of us know that there can't be a strategic alliance between P&G and Levers we were at another crossroad where we started thinking about um, you know so what are we going to do uh, choose the company or choose the husband and uh, so both of us 
got out in the market and since Sandeep is not on this call, I can safely say I was more employable then. So I moved on to City and he stuck around with Weavers. Um, that, was a, that was another crossroad in our life where we had to choose or I had to choose how do I go about managing it. Um, and I want to pause here a bit because very often I have a lot of employees, both men and women, come and talk to us at this crossroad in their life that you know their partner is in a different city or in a region. So what should they do? And here is how it goes. You know, men will typically say, I want to move to the US because my to be wife is going to be there. Women will come and tell me, hey, I'll quit because I'm going to get married and the spouse to be is in the US. And uh, so I get very different reactions. And the reason why I'm talking about it is that actually, I don't know why that happens. The, the woman who's working here could well ask for a transfer to the US, but it doesn't happen that easily. Uh, women tend to kind of throw in the towel much more easily because for them, uh, keeping the family together, you know, uh, making some compromises to be together is of paramount importance. Not, it, not that it is not for the husband or the man, but because there's one partner coming along, men don't kind of stretch out on that front. Um, so for us, that was a big crossroad, and I think therein started our tries with a two-city marriage. Uh, when I joined City, I was with Delhi. I was in Delhi, and he was with Unilever in Mumbai. And at that point of time, I said, "Look, you know, I can't keep making job changes, so we're going to just take it out and make it work, and we'll see what future holds." Uh, so I, so we were a Delhi Mumbai kind of, pull, and we did it like that for a couple of years. Then we moved to Singapore for a while. And then we kind of, uh, I, he followed me to Singapore, I, he followed me to New York, and then he got a, uh, he was getting coached for an assignment in London, and then I followed him to London. So as a dual working couple, I think we kind of made it work, uh, depending on which location, you know, we could make things work for the other partner. Uh, I think London was an extremely interesting experience because, uh, you know, this was the whole mobility bit, and I would talk about marriage, mobility, and modernity. In the in the mobility bit, as we were making it work, by the time we reached London, we had two children. We um, were trying trying to adapt to a different culture, to having careers and jobs. And after about four or five years of settling down in London, my husband decides to come back to India. Now, this was a very tough crossroad for us as a family because I wasn't ready to come back to India at that point of time. And uh, my children wanted to actually go back to the US. So we were four members of the family living in four different directions. And uh, we thought about it a lot. We debated a lot. And I think finally my husband and I decided that we're going to have a split family all over again, wherein I stay back in London and he would return to India. Uh, and, he, and that's how we two years between London and Delhi. Uh, and I think where there's a will, there is a way. Everybody thought, you know, we'd gone crazy, including my mother. Uh, and she couldn't understand uh, why we would do this. Uh, you know, as a mother, she was always concerned of being. So she would often tell me things like, you know, so, you know, he earns well enough and he has a great job. And why would you do this to yourself? And, you know, this is not how life is. And this is not how, you know, you stay as a family. And, and my question is, who really decides that? And I think so long as, you know, you as a new work and your relationships are strong, everything else falls into place. I think this whole definition of, you know, we all have to be in the same place, same time, can work both ways. And I'm not saying this is for everybody. I think you've got to be comfortable with your own, uh, you know, construct of how you want to do this work-life balance. So I think mobility for us was key in the way in our careers. Um, at no point in my career, I've said, okay, I'm going to just take a back seat because Sandeep needs to move into this job. But however, fine that we have small kids, so to the extent we can keep the connectivity going, it's fine. We didn't get divorced. We are yet happily married. Um, so that worked out well as well. And finally, you know, when a good job opened up in India, I came back to India. And that was by choice for a professional move. And it all finally worked out in the end. So I think you've got to persist the path. I think you've got to be, first of all, clear about what you want and what you're looking for. Because if you don't know where you're going, you know, anything will take you there. And I think that happens very often. Uh, many a times, you know, when I'm kind of mentoring a few people, including women, people come and say, oh, you know, I'm kind of done with this job. I want to do something different. The moment I ask, okay, what do you want to do? Uh, they would turn around and ask me, what do you think I should do? And the real answer, I don't know, because my answer may not be your answer. So you've got to be clear about what your path is. 
for example i often say you know people who are uh, homemakers i have a lot of respect for them because i think they've given up a lot to give everything to their home um and it's absolutely fine so long as none under any social pressure any duress or any kind of a mindset it's been done knowingly because if that doesn't happen then i know enough mums who when you know when the kids fly away to college are searching what is their meaning what is the purpose of life because children grow up after the age of 16 they don't really recall what you did for them when they were 3 or 5 and there is a whole empty nest feeling which i've seen women suffering much more than men uh, because most men don't give up their careers so i think it's being homemaker by choice knowing very well what you're getting yourself into stable but what we tend to find the majority of the women tend to do it under social pressure you know i can't um, leave my child home alone i don't have enough support um you know my mother or my husband are not very supportive so there are all kinds of pressures which work around this <clears throat> and i think that's where the problem is because you know if that is done then you know one industry is bereft of the talent and as individuals um you know you probably have not maximized your potential especially professionally um so i think you know that clarity of purpose and where you want to take this journey is extremely important uh once you're clear you got to fuel it fuel it up with enough conviction about why so one is you know what you want to do and then the why do you want to do it you want to do this not because somebody tells you to do this you want to do this not because you know this diva is telling you to do this not because sarika tells you to do this not because anu tells you to do this you want to do this because this is what really matters to you and i think realizing that takes a bit of time it's intellectually all good but realizing that takes a bit of time for me that moment of reckoning happened when i made the change from medical school to a business management career uh, it wasn't easy and i can tell you for sure that my mother thought that theek hai abhi graduation kar lo 3 saal iske baad kar denge because she didn't know which way i was going to go maybe i didn't know either but as i said i was very clear what i didn't want to do and i was kind of finding my cloud but the good was going to be mine and the bad is going to be mine so moving on further i think the mobility bit i've spoken about and you know i'm i'm blessed with two children so maternity is a beautiful crossroad which i had to cross as well and um, you know the first one i didn't know what kind of hit me because as a new mother you kind of are you know taken aback with the, with the, all the responsibility that uh, motherhood bestows on you but by the time i had my second one i was wiser i remember when i went on my second mat leave i was very clear with the organization about what i'm going to come back to. um and i think there were moments when i came back uh, after my first mat leave and i was put on to project uh, which i think kind of kept me going for a few months but then i found it very frustrating so i recall a conversation with my boss then uh, which was a tough one where i had to go and talk to him and say look i'm not really enjoying what i'm doing um and he was quite shocked because in his head he was trying to give me flexibility when i hadn't asked for one he needed to check with me whether i had flexibility he assumed it because you know obviously a lot of new young mothers around him wanted that flexibility and that's absolutely fine but every mother is not the same and every mother doesn't work in the same way and for me the learning was you know why did i wait for 3 months i should have you know spoken to him at the onset but when i was having this chat which loud and clear i said you know what i don't need to leave a 3 or 4 month child behind at home if you don't give me anything meaningful to do and do at work um so i think he understood it and i kind of landed myself in the right job that i was looking to do so you got to ask for what is yours because if you don't ask you don't get i'm not saying you every time you ask you will get what you are asking for but be realistic about what you want what you ask the organizer for and before you ask for it you also got to earn the equity and make it worth the while when i decided to do london delhi for two years you know it wasn't easy i was heading hr for investment banking in the midst of financial crisis so trying to make that work you needed organization to step up in the way you were going to make i was doing a full on european role spending 10 days in india and flying back and forth your relationships and your equity has to be very strong and it happens over a period of time so i think coming back into you know wanting uh, 
um, enough out of your professional pursuit is something you've got to think about. You've also got to have the you know courage and the conviction to pursue art. And once you start to pull this together, you know lots of other support will start to kind of kick in. Sorry, just give me a second. Just something. Yeah. So lots of other support starts to kick in. Um, I think I I'd think like to I just briefly mention some things. Tools and um, you know networking, networking. and uh, reaching out to people. So I think the forums like these are very very helpful. Uh, and I, I even till today, I don't only go as a speaker. I would also participate in listening to journey of men and women. Um, so I think continuous learning and figuring out what has worked for somebody else, see what can be applied to you is useful. So keep engaging and networking. Find a sponsor. Uh, find somebody who really believes in you, believes in your capability, knows you well, and is in a position of influence. Uh, find a mentor, uh, somebody you think actually gets some steer, some guidance from. And uh, most importantly, find, you know, have, you've got to have the family support. So you know, you've got to make your parents or your in-laws or your uh, husband understand what what is it that you want to do professionally and how they can pursue the help you pursue the path as well so i think all of this starts to come together but i think the first step is what you need to take which is where do you want to take this what is your aspiration in life and i'll be very very candid here that i find that that is yet lacking i can't tell you and it's it's very very frustrating for us the number of conversation I land up having, especially when women get married or they have babies or there is a caregiving responsibility at home, it's just so easy. And they just come in and say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to be at home or I'll do something part time or I will do something this. And I thought there's so much investment which has gone into your education, your life. Why wouldn't you want to reach your potential? And I think, you know, it makes it easier for women because socially it's quite acceptable. How many men can do that and get away with it? None. No. I think it's increasingly becoming a little more acceptable. But even then, the percentage of men you find at home with a working wife is probably negligible. Leave alone with a working, a working wife, you know, being on themselves because it's socially shunned by the society. So I think I will just turn the lens on the women where you're going to be wanting of, you know, some of the aspirations that you have. You've got to be having the 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 fuel to you know light the fire to kind of achieve what you want and, and it's Ooh. it's only then when things start to fall into place so i'll just kind of pause here rashmi and uh, you know i can go on and on so you got to tell me if you know you want a question or uh, you know you want me to continue yeah Thank you, Anranjitha. In fact, I was just uh, wanting to barge in and you know sort of take a pause here uh, because you've said so many things uh, 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 over the last 15-20 uh, minutes that you've been speaking. Uh, uh, you know, for most of them was about you know you have crossroads in your life and you have to make your own choices. You have to uh, you know know you have to take a bet on yourself and if you won't, then who else will? And uh, it's uh, you know you need to know uh, where you're going and. Uh, what you want to do and why you want to do. So I now want to you know, sort of keep the platform open for questions uh, and understand what people uh, are thinking about the views that Anranjita has just spoken about. And we would love to make the session more interactive. So if you could just type in your questions here, uh, you know, we will then be, uh, you know, Anranjita will be, you know, sort of answering them. So it's open to everybody. Please, please type in your uh, questions here on the chat. And Anuranjita, today we have people uh, uh, coming in from across India, and we have uh, so we have a couple of our leadership programs running across India uh, in a couple of organizations. So we have our uh, women leaders, uh, women emerging women leader participants from there. We have people who are on our uh, mentoring program. You are also a mentor in a program. So we have our mentees also who have joined in uh, a, a, over the over the webinar today. So okay, we have Usha Ravindran who is uh, typing in. Okay. Okay. 
we have a whole host of uh, standard chartered participants who have joined in from Chennai as well. Uh, they were very keen to you know sort of interact with you. So open, I mean, uh, expect people from uh, Chennai also to you know sort of ask the questions. Okay, so Usha is writing saying that uh, we are amazed with the number of crossroads you had. Most important living in different locations. How did you convince yourself? Uh, how did you convince yourself before you could convince others? Uh, you know, moving around and uh, okay, that's the most difficult part for me. No, I understand, Usha, and I think. Um, you know, as far as my, you know, for me, I think when I started working, I don't think it was ever an option not to work. Uh, and that probably came from a bit of a background. I've always had a working mother and workman in, in my family. So that was not an option. So if there was a choice, but that was not an option. So there was, there was this whole inner, um, uh, you know, inner, um, uh, I would say, energy where I said, I've got to make something out of my life. And I think that is your own um, drive, your own ambition. And I'm not saying what works for me necessarily works for everybody, but you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you want to do? So that's point number one. Once you figure that out, then you've got to figure out who you need to convince. Is it your immediate family? Is it your husband? Is it, you know, extended family? And I think, it's your if it's your family who genuinely cares for you and they understand that you whether it's working you know in different locations or pursuing a certain profession is what really makes you happy uh, they will come along but that has to come with i mean i think if i was to tell my husband i'm going to be sitting at he knows i'll be miserable and he wouldn't want to see me like that so it doesn't take much horsepower to convince convince him but i think you've got to make a stand how important this is for you. Why do you want to do it? For me, the most important convince, convincing crossroad was when I had to explain it to my mother and my mother-in-law why I wouldn't with a six-year-old and an 11-year-old and my husband would be in Delhi. And then somewhere in between, we moved the kids to India because I said, okay, I will come to India after a year and a half. Both, you know, both parents and in-laws were not happy because we had young children. And they said, how the hell to make it work? And I said, you know what, they're grandchildren also. So, you know, I made friends with my mother-in-law and my mother to kind of help me out, take care of my children. Wasn't easy. You know, a lot of the time people tell you, what a wicked mother you are, you know, how could you do this? You know, you're only six, seven years. Yeah, but you know, I would take the pain every month, every two weeks, I would travel at one week because my son was there. If I, there were times in office when I would get a call he well I wanted to just like in a jiffy get back to India but I take the next flight out so you make efforts what suffered was like my social life but then you got to prioritize in life in terms of how you make it work so I think you want to convince others make sure they understand what makes you happy make sure they understand how you're going to work and also at some level don't give too many people to make that choice the choice has to be yours not somebody else's and then they'll come along so I hope I'm, you know, I don't know whether I've addressed your question, but I hope, you know, I've shared at least my perspective. Um, there are a couple of other comments and questions here. So if it's okay, I will kind of move ahead. Uh, one is, of course, from Priyanka, which is my cue is if a young professional woman wants to convey uh, she is there for long term, how can she influence perception and be taken seriously? So Priyanka. Um, you know, there are stereotypes, there are unconscious biases at work, and very often, you know, people who have never worked with women or they've never had women, career women in their life, not working women, may start with a different perception. So I want to share an example. In City, we did a program on unconscious biases, where we have 15 of us in the leadership team, two women, rest are all men. And when the trainer said, how many of you have had your mums working? Two hands went up, mine and another guy. When they said, how many of you have wives working? Three hands went up, right? Oh, sorry, spouses working. So two women and another guy. Now think about it. If these men have never been exposed to career women, and there's a difference between working women and career women. 
Working means you're doing a job. You know, you want a paycheck, you want some pocket money, and you're kind of, you know, going along with the flow. Career means you're vested. This is your passion. There's a difference. So I think when you're not exposed to how a career woman works, uh, you go by what you see around you, which could be your own. So I think first, the first step to convincing them that need to be taken seriously is communicate. Talk, talk about your action, then talk about how seriously you want to pursue it. So people understand you better. And I think the many a times, it's the maternity example that I was talking about, that I just assumed that I want to do flexi, and I didn't want to. But he didn't ask me because, you know, his wife probably done it and other people in the team had done it. So it's communication, it's engagement. The second thing is whatever you do, do it well. I mean, there is a basic hygiene factor at work where whatever you do, you do it well. Uh, and the third is, you know, life is competitive. So when you get into the corporate world, um, you know, it's, it's just it's going to be competitive for both men and women. So let that not set you back. I mean, learn to deal with it. Very often I have women coming and saying, no, um, if I'm in a boardroom, people shout and scream, I can't. Well, you don't have to shout to be heard, but you can be firm and raise your hand and saying, hey, it's done. And be rude if somebody doesn't listen to you. So be ready for competition. I find there's a lot of women at junior levels and mid levels, but when you go to the leadership pipeline, the percentage of women that we find is, is minuscule in spite of all the efforts that has been done in the India corporate world, very women um, who are ready to get into the sea suit. And that happens because women just out, and that goes back to the point of aspiration gap. So when you go for the CEO role, you know, I can tell you, men don't have it any easier than a woman. They have different issues to deal with. I have a husband who's a CEO, and I can see that he's stressed out as well on different counts, and I have different stresses. So I think you've got to have an action plan to know how to navigate the cover, and you've got to communicate, engage, and be vocal about your aspirations. Uh, sorry, I, there's a comment from Somna. Uh, good to hear from you, Somna. Uh, um, sorry, I, I think it's gone up. I can't see it anymore. Uh, well, I can see it. Maybe uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I can. So uh, Somna is actually also uh, leads the uh, Bank of America HR uh, uh, practice I and mean, she's the head of HR there. So Somna, welcome. Uh, yeah. She says, great message, Anuranjita, really inspired. Do you think women take less risk than men? Uh, did this thought come, what if this does not work? Uh, you think women I, take I less think risk than men? Women who take as much risk as men on sometimes more risk. Yeah, I, I don't think so. But I think the number of women who take less risk than men are lesser. I think it's just a volume game. So I think women who cross the hump probably then, you know, kind of straddle and then, you know, they, they take more risk, they try different because they have tasted success. But I think to get, get them over the hump, um, you know, it takes much more effort. What I tend to find is many more women cop out before the hump. But if they cross the mid mid career um, crossroad, then they are probably as competitive as men. Uh, so it's a volume game. Um, and I would say, yes, in a volume sense, less women take the risk. But once they take it, then they are at par. Uh, um, so moving okay, on. Okay, and the next on, next Sunanda, question is from Deepthi. Deepthi? Uh, then... Yeah, Deepthi, yeah. You want to read it out? Yes. She says, women need to take charge of what we want and fuel it up addiction and passion. What is that one advice that you would give in terms of how to manage the perceptions at work through different stages of women's life, like marriage or maternity? Does proactive communication always help? I think... Um, so there are two questions, perceptions and, and I communication. think you've got to have a game plan. I think... Yeah. So I think just addressing the perception part of it, um, perceptions will exist and perceptions are not realities. But unfortunately, people's reaction towards you is driven by the perception they have of you. you know, they may think you're a woman, so when you go on mat leave, you may never come back, so I need to figure something else out. Or you're getting married, you're gonna move away with your husband. Now, believe you me, these perceptions are also driven by the fact because this actually does happen, right? So this does happen. What it does is it makes it 
for the women who don't want to fall into life. So I think one is, uh, um, you know, as you write, proactive communication absolutely helps. I think more than just the communication, you've got to have a game plan. So when you get into a place where you feel that there might be some perceptions prevailing, you got to have a game plan where you say, OK, this is how I navigate my career in the short to midterm. I'm not I'm not going to talk about long term, but next three to five years, I got to do these two, three months. There will be crossroads. But, you know, men get married too, and men become other too, but they don't deviate from those action plans. Why do women deviate? Yes, I can understand maternity leave is six months, but for God's sake, it's only six months in a career of 35 years. So it can't deviate you so much that your action plan goes for it. So I think having that tip planning is extremely important. I find that women get far more influenced by who sets what, you know, including people at work, including with people at home, and deviate from that action planning a uh, little more easily when some of these personal crossroads uh, arise. So have that action plan and stick to it, and people will take this lead. Be proactive about asking, not just only really communicating. Go out and say, look, I want this assignment. And here is why, here are three reasons why I think I can do it. You know, I've had a different problem. Sometimes people will say, I know you're just, you know, you're, too, you're coming across as saying, okay, I really want it. And then you're pushing this too hard. And I said, yeah, because if I don't, who else will? Um, sometimes a pushy, an ambitious woman doesn't fall into this eye. But so be it. You know, because if you don't ask, you don't get. So I think you've got to have a game plan. You gotta have the energy to push that through. Um, you you know you know when if you if you are looking for an assignment, then you ask how you get there rather than why you didn't get it. Um, and then keep engaged. You know if if you have kids and you want to you know spend your maternity leave differently, you have to talk about it. If you want to navigate career in a flexible way, you have to talk about it. The example that I'd like to share. So when I came back to India, you know my kids are well settled in Delhi. So I refused to move to Bombay. And when I was interviewing with Prameet for this job, I was very clear. I said, look, if I do this, I will ping pong between Delhi and Bombay. And he looked at me and said, your ecosystem is always disturbed. Sometimes Delhi, London, sometimes Delhi, Bombay. And I said, but what is it? Because you know, I don't even, I'm on the same time zone. So for me, I've worked, worked through multiple time zones. So this did, that didn't bother me, but it bothered him because he felt I was a young mother. So how was I going to manage this? And I had to explain it to him. And for three or four months, I had to kind of make sure it worked in a way that made everybody comfortable. And it worked. And I'm, you know, now four and a half years in this job, so we obviously got something right. So back to you, Rashmi. Yep. So, uh, <coughs> great, great, great answers. And I think everybody is very, very uh, thankful and very, very inspired by your, uh, by your uh, answers. Um, there is this one question from Ajita Mohanty where she's talking about politics in the corporate world and she's asking whether women are equally placed, equally placed to handle politics as men do. And there's an assumption that men handle politics more than women do. What's your take on that? Yeah, so that's an, uh, yeah, that's an assumption. I think women are really good to handle this. You know, think about it. Just step out of the corporate world and think about family politics for a minute. You know, all those funny serials which come on TV. That's all about family politics. And who are at the center of it? Women. So I think that women are actually very good. And politics somehow has this very negative connotation. So let's talk about dynamics or human dynamics. And I think women are very well placed to do it at home. The only thing is how do they translate it into office? And I think when you're a minority, which sometimes women are, it can be a bit intimidating in the way you deal with it because you feel a bit insecure. You know, if I said this, so and so will think about me in which way. But that's the bit you need to kind of, you know, get yourself secure with by having a network, by having mentors, by having sponsors. But I think actually women are better equipped in terms of navigating human dynamics uh, because I think they have a better intuitive sense. Um, they kind of, uh, kind of. I just find that the whole uh, empathy bit comes a little more easily. Um, and sometimes, you know, let's talk about negative politics where, you know, somebody's trying to get somebody. And that's part of competition. So if you've been through school and college, be it a girl's college or a girl, it's existed there. So I don't think you should ever find a captain anyway. The only thing may be, you know, fewer of you in a working environment and more so as you grow senior. 
But I'll tell you what, at a senior level, leadership is gender agnostic. Nobody cares a damn what happens in, you know, how many men or women in the boardroom, so long as you can manage it rightly. So I think what you have to do is step back from the organization, you know, dynamics which are happening. You've got to analyze it. You've got to figure out your move. It's a game of chess. And if you get that chess right, you are fine. So I think that's a bit gender agnostic. I think women just sometimes I find them fumbling because of the number of women in the room rather than their ability to manage politics. Yeah, great, great answer. So there's another question from Shikha uh, where she says that, uh, you know, I want to ask after a particular tough year due to some personal circumstances, if you have to take a back foot at work, how does one go establishing oneself again as a high potential ambitious professional? Uh, and uh, who is also capable of contributing significantly to the business. She's talking about taking a back seat and coming back. How do you establish yourself? So, yeah, so you take a break. I mean, that happens. And, uh, you know, people take the now. Nowadays, people take breaks quite uh, willingly and voluntarily. I think, the, you know, the couple of things you need to do if you're taking a break. One is when you start all over, all over again, you got to be realistic about where you are today because if you've been away from work for say a year or maybe two years the world around you is dynamic and it has moved on so you got to figure out where you can be relevant and if there is a new skill to acquire um, and i often find when you know men or women are coming back to work they haven't really figured that bit out that how relevant they are and what skills they need to acquire so i think getting back into the job market or getting back into an organization that assessment is extremely important. And once you're back, you're back on the trend. So, you know, it'll from there on, it, your clock will start ticking about how you perform and, you know, what you contribute and what you value add. And if you're able to display high performance, high leadership, there is really no reason why you wouldn't be considered as a high potential. But I think after the break, that assessment, you know, equipping yourself, assessing, Reskilling yourself is important. I would never recommend that if you've taken a two year break, you go completely, you know, cold into the market. You would have moved on. The other issue I find, and this is very India specific, but when we tend to hire women, second career women, you know, there are times where, you know, if you've taken a break of four years and you're coming, you will have a situation where your peers have moved on. And I tend to find in India that relativities are very important. So, no, I will not work with this person because he or she is my batchmate from college or MBA school. I think you've got to leave that behind because you decided to take four years off for a very good reason. Life has moved on. So realign your thinking and be realistic about where you're starting out. It's nothing different than when you started your career. And then go about it with your action plan, key milestones, track yourself, nothing different. We've had, you know, this year we had six women who've had career breaks and they've come back to work and they are roaring to go. I, I really don't see them any different than a lot of other talented professionals. It's just that they're realistic about their start point is slightly different and if they can, they can speed across or they can pace themselves out. That's their choice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anuranjita. So there's the next question from Sati uh, Mukund. Who shares, uh, you know, I just try to, you know, sort of summarize her question. She's saying that, you know, women have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they're known as the nurturers and caregivers, whereas men are known as the providers. And uh, at the same time, back in office, women have to keep competing with men, also having to complete their nurturer, caregiver, uh, you know, sort of responsibilities at home. So, how do you sort of manage that? So, basically, she's talking about work life balance. Uh, Work-life balance for women. Yeah. Is that the question? Especially because of stereotypical, uh, uh, you know, responsibilities which are given to them. Yeah. Yeah, but look, you know, don't try and be a superwoman because that's a fiction, right? So I think you know, work-life balance to me is a very personal concept. And it's about prioritization. You know, it's never 50-50. So there are times when for both husband and I, work is very important where I'll be 24 by 7 at work, which, you know, like this week. And 
you know, it's going to be a concentrated week because there are multiple priorities. But I would have planned um, because I wish to plan it like that. I, I mean, I'm not a control freak, but I would have sat with, a, with my maid and made the menu for the whole week, what the kids are going to eat. Um, you know, I so would have sorted my mom to come in if anything is needed. Um, and then there are times where I am just at home. I am take my flexi and I'll work out of home because, you know, kids are having something in school. So I think it's a bit of a prioritizing from time to time. And you got to kind of draw your own um, uh, boundaries. Um, so I'll give you another example. When I came back to India, and everybody knows I do Bombay, Delhi. So Monday to Friday, I used to be here. And then weekends, I would go back to Kurga. And, you know, there was a leadership team meeting, which got scheduled for a Saturday afternoon on some brainstorming stuff. Um, yeah, and I probably sent a decline and I said no sorry I will not come for this meeting because it doesn't seem like it's a crisis it's one of those meetings which could happen on a Monday um, and everybody was like how can you say no to it you know nobody says no for this kind of stuff and it wasn't just the culture of doing it and I said no I do because if, you know this is my family time and I'm not I will not work Saturday Sunday if there is a crisis something is very urgent I make myself available but you know if you're just going to sit around the table and have a glass of beer and talk about, you know, how to, it's really not my idea of spending a Saturday afternoon. And believe you me, it was tough. You know, I thought maybe somebody will get take offense to this. But, you know, it set the tone. It set the tone that, you know, she's not, she's there. Let's be clear. We call her when it's urgent. And what's wrong with that? And maybe I've reached that stage in life where I could demand that out of the organization. And I know it's tougher. But I think in your own work, at different levels, you've got to be able to do it. Um, and I think I particularly find that, you know, in, in our country, we kind of have this habit of identifying with work a bit too much. And so it's 24 by 7, especially for men. But I think, you know, you can manage home and whether it's just that don't try and make it 50-50. There will be days where work will take precedent and there will be days where home will take precedent. If there is something pressing at both ends, get help. You know, I am very shameless. I will go and talk to my mother. I will get my mother-in-law. I will also insist that my husband takes leave and sit at home if I can't. And my supposing my son is unwell. Why not? You know, my work is important. His work is important. But there are days where my work is more important than his work. So I will make, I will negotiate with extended network. And by the way, if there is something at school, which I would have liked to be there because there's something which came up at work, I wouldn't kill myself for it because it's okay. So I think, you know, it's also we women burden ourselves so much that we don't let up doing everything and then we start to kill ourselves with guilt. So don't do that. And I think, you know, as far as competition back at work is concerned, uh, you know, finally, at least, you know, in a lot of companies, it will be about the outcome. There are offices, as you've written, you know, where you sit late and, you know, that's a cultural issue to me. And I think if you are proactively engaging and you're getting things right, uh, and if you have a boss who thinks, you know, only if you go home at 9 o'clock when you're working hard, my advice is to change your boss. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Sati was saying that it's uh, not just work-life balance, it's also more of perception management in office. I think uh, Anranjita has already spoken about that, uh, Sati. So, um, our next question is from Chetali, where she's talking about what do you think are the major common behaviors that women uh, show uh, which puts them at a disadvantage in work, at the workplace? So, I don't know the behavioral uh, challenges are, they don't talk, they talk very little. Um, so if you don't talk, you're not heard. And sometimes if you're not heard, you don't exist. Uh, I think women are just more conscious about, and I actually, you know, it's a tough one because what happens is when you get into a meeting, they're just more men. So some women, when they're not, when they're not sure about themselves, even though they know everything and they've got, they will not talk because it's either discomforting or it's intimidating or the environment is not inclusive and comfortable. But I would advise you saying, you know, even if you're uncomfortable, talk. Because that's how it will get comfortable. So staying quiet is not an option. 
because that makes you feel invisible. Uh, the second is, uh, you know, I would say it's a it's again a bit tricky, but I think I find that um, women are extremely good at managing conflicts, especially when it comes to personal conflicts at home. But I think they get a bit torn when the conflicts at work. And I don't know why, but that's been my experience. I may be wrong, but I find that conflicts at work more than often, um, you know, I find at junior mid level, they tend to come out now, especially at the mid. Uh, it could be other pressures which are on their head, but I think you've got to learn to manage the conflicts at work because they will always exist. For example, we were talking about late sitting and the perception and, you know, somebody thinking bad of you. Let that not impact you so much that you start assessing yourself, but learn to manage conflicts, learn to manage aggression at work sometimes. Aggression doesn't mean assertion. Aggression doesn't mean ambition. Aggression purely means bad behavior. Um, and so learn to say no where it feels uncomfortable at work um, and be demanding of what you feel you deserve. Um, so I would say conflict resolution and being demanding of reserve is important. And third and the last one would think, uh, you know, I think wanting. And I think, uh, you know, the whole, um, you know, push to, uh, you know, aspire to be at the top and being vocal about it is important. I don't see that enough at workplace. And again, it's a catch 22 because I find that a lot of women who kind of are vocal are then branded differently. But as I said, you know, I would rather be branded differently and get what I want rather than not speaking my mind at all, which would anyway what I want. Uh, so those will be the few things. I don't know whether they're behaviors or they are the ways of dealing with situations at home, but I think uh, those are things which I think would be important. Okay, so speaking up is very, very important. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Sunanda, uh, which is talking about, do you yeah. think if a woman is not working and sitting at home due to any reason, will society accept that in a positive way? If he's taking responsibility of all household chores for his working wife, will society accept that in a positive way? So basically she's talking about male, men's being staying at home fathers or staying at yeah yeah so i mean you know, this is my view and uh, is that we're not ready for that even if a man wants to do it i think uh, think about it i mean a lot of you are on this webinar just reflect if you have men in your family who would do this what will your extended family say and that's really the answer. So my is right now, the society, at least in this part of the world, is not ready. I have seen increasing examples of that in the West. <clears throat> I've seen increasing examples of, you know, like we have Jane Fraser, whose husband, by the way, was a very successful banker with Goldman Sachs. She got a really big role with Siri in New York. He quit his job and he moved. But they're far and few. Uh, and I think even in the Western world, we do struggle. Uh, with this whole concept. And so it's very, very deep seated. I think if a man, today we've at least reached that stage that if a man wants to take a break for six months and be at home, that's perfectly acceptable. But if it's on an ongoing basis, I think you just need to be a little immune to the social pressure because I suspect that is yet there in the system. Great. So, um... So any few last comments? We have just about four minutes left I'm in sorry, the webinar. Sorry, if I can so. add, yeah, I, I just want to add to the, to the last question. I mean, one good example of this is paternity leave. So like, for example, we have one month of paternity leave. Just the other day, a journalist called me and said, is he willing to make this three months? And I said, no, I will not make this three months or six months like a lot of other companies, because I'll tell you what, the utilization of even one is low. This is fully paid paternity leave with no stress about your wife working with city or your wife working at all. We are just telling men, please go home and spend time with your newborn. They don't do it. And why don't they do it? And we've taken all efforts within the organization so that nobody feels under pressure. Average utilization rate of paternity leave in corporate India would be 10 days. You check stats in any company. Now that's telling you something. So, you know, we can keep putting interventions in place, but there is a basic social 
fat ray, which is taking much longer to change. Sorry, Rashmi. Those are my last few comments, unless there is another question. No, so last few comments from you. Uh, you know, you've already spoken. Uh, you've told us that you know you need to have a plan. We need to be uh, speaking up. Uh, we need to have uh, be have proactive communication. A anything apart from these that you would want to give us last few words, uh, wisdom, words of wisdom. I would say you know live your life fully. I think as women, I, as we grow up, we have been, you know, just groomed in a way that there are different demands and, you know, there is a certain persona you got to fit in and it's not even the stereotype. And we constrain ourselves from just living our own uh, wishes. We are always living for somebody else. So my advice in a nice way is don't be a sacrificial goal and don't live your life fully. If you want to go for that guitar lesson, go now, because life is passing by. You want to learn diving, learn now. You know, you want to do a different kind of a job, to go and work for a startup, do it now. But live it. And in a different way, I feel that as women, we are a little more fortunate. Going back to the previous question, society does accept that a woman can sit at home and it's perfectly okay. So make the most of it. Then do something different, take more risks in life, do different kind of work, do different kind of jobs, you know, take bets of different kind um, and be a little more kind on yourself rather than always seeing as yourself as a daughter, as a mother, as a wife, or as, you know, as a, as a daughter-in-law. I just think you need to see yourself for who you are and love yourself for who you are.